So I want to introduce uh, two people who are going to be helping us in this conversation. Um, they are wonderful friends and great resources uh, to know and to try and uh, be able to inform us in this moment where there's a lot of uh, misinformation. Uh, one is Jen Bernstein, who is uh, a fantastic leader for the National Council of Jewish Women here in St. Louis. And uh, another is Benj Singer, uh, who uh, is a leader with Show Me Integrity, which works on a whole slew of voter access, voting rights issues, and uh, helping us secure uh, our democracy. So welcome to both of you. It's a pleasure to get to uh, talk with you and engage this conversation. So first off, let us jump in. In just a few weeks, we will be having an August 6th primary. What are some of the big things that are happening in this primary that you want people to be focused on? Sure. Well, thanks for having us. I'll hop in here. Uh, it's great to be with you, Rabbi and Jen. So if you are in the St. Louis area, which probably uh, most, if not all of you are, um, there are a couple of congressional primaries. Obviously, there's a very hot uh, congressional primary in the first congressional district. I know we'll be hearing a little bit later about some efforts to get the Jewish community to turn out and vote as much as possible, not telling anyone who to vote for, just making sure we have maximum Jewish voter turnout. Uh, and in that first congressional district, that includes the city of St. Louis and North St. Louis County and parts of University City, Clayton, Olivet, Creve and Maryland Heights. Uh, and that is between the three uh, leading candidates in that race are uh, incumbent Congresswoman Cori Bush, St. Louis County Prosecutor Wesley Bell, and former state representative Maria Chappelle Nadal. That's in the first congressional district in the Democratic primary. In the second congressional district, which includes West St. Louis County and um, other nearby areas, uh, there is a Democratic primary uh, between uh, a couple of, of Democrats, including notably Ray Hartman, who uh, had founded, you know, is best known for founding the Riverfront Times. Uh, and then, you know, every, a lot of people don't realize, but every August and every November, it's not just federal, it also includes many state primaries, uh, county level primaries. So in the city of St. Louis and the county of St. Louis, for instance, a lot of county officials in both of those counties, which are separate counties under state law, um, people running in the Democratic primary, Republican primary, other party primaries. Um, Jen, anything you want to add in terms of uh, things that are top of mind on the primary ballot? Well, NCJW is actually, since we're a 501c3, we do not really, you know, we, and obviously you did not say whom to vote for, but um, we do not endorse candidates, nor do we really even focus on those races. And the, the two big issues that are, that pertain to NCJW, this go around will likely happen in November if they're certified. And that is the abortion initiative petition that we were instrumental in, in gathering signatures and also the healthy families initiative. So we are really looking, fingers crossed that the secretary of state will certify both of those initiatives and that will, they will be on the November ballot. So keep your uh, eyes open for that and your ears open for that. And we will keep you posted on, on those. But um, all the things that are going to be spoken about today are super important for any election. So we're excited to be here. Uh, I want to reiterate what Jen just said, that those two ballot initiatives, which are on the statewide ballot, are incredibly important. The Healthy Families Fair Wages would increase the minimum wage and also offer, allow anyone, any job to accrue sick time, which is a huge important piece. We do not want people to be going to work while they're sick. That's not good for them or the people around them or really anyone's workplace, um, as well as uh, the abortion access bill that uh, NCJW has really been head of the charge leading that. Um, and there is every reason to optimistically expect that those will be on the November ballot and stay tuned probably in September when we have some certified language. Um, we'll be jumping back in to bring you all the details about that and how you can get involved and uh, 
details you need to know for November. Um, and I wanted to give um, JCRC a, a big round of applause for their work on healthy families because they were instrumental in bringing that to the forefront in our community. So wanted to thank you all for that because it's they're both so important. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of other uh, amendments that are on this primary ballot. Uh, one is Amendment 1. Uh, it is a very, very short description. Um, I've had lots of people ask me questions about Amendment 1. Basically, the, the summary is it uh, provides an exemption on property taxes for places that are child care centers. So if there is a child care center or an early childhood center, um, they would be exempt from paying state property tax. Um, there is not a lot more description than that. I've had many people ask me, like, is this actually like an end around or a sneaky way to do something? I don't think so. If, I don't know if people have more information about that, but it seems pretty straightforward. Um, uh, it's an easy thing to read about, uh, and you can decide on the merits of that one. The other is uh, there's an Amendment 4, which talks about police spending for the city of Kansas City. Uh, people may not know, but most cities are in charge of their city's police department. Uh, the city of Kansas City is not in charge of their own police department. It is technically overseen by the state of Missouri. And so there's a ballot measure that would uh, mandate minimum amounts of spending, a minimum percentage of uh, the revenue taken in by the city that would have to be spent on the police department. Um, I believe that it would increase to 25% of its general revenue. Uh, currently, right now, uh, they've been about at that level already, but it's been voluntary. Um, and this would make that level of spending mandatory for the city to spend on its police department. Uh, so that is another big issue to consider um, and to, to look into. Um, as, as we already noted though, there's not, there, while this is a primary election, there are a lot of races where people who win their primaries may not have a competitive opponent outside of their party. And so it's really important to look, uh, Benj mentioned the first and second district races, but look in, you know, if you do not live in the first and second district, look in your own district to see because of the way the districts are set out, um, it may be really important to make your voice heard in the primary because your uh, potential favorite candidate may not foes may not face strong opposition, excuse me, uh, in the general election. And that's important to note. And it is very different district to district. Um, that's right. And so I will note two things. I'm going to drop a link in the chat where you can do your sample ballot lookup. Wait and do it afterwards because we're still going to share a lot of important information with you. Uh, but I really want to underscore what Rabbi Shafran said, which is that in, frankly, most if not all of the elections for candidates will be voting on, the primary basically is the election. And if you wanna have a say in electing someone of your choice, then three weeks from yesterday is the day to show up. Um, but also as Jen and Rabbi both said, there are really important ballot measures at the bottom of the ballot on both the August 6th and the November elections. So I'm sure we'll be doing more events and a lot more messaging that you'll receive about the November election. But if you want to have a say in who is elected, regardless of who that is, show up August 6th. And I think we're going to actually talk about some early voting options as well. Um, and it's even better and easier for you to show up before August 6th. So we'll talk about that shortly. So I want to I want to roll off what Benj was just saying and, you know, kind of get to the basics there is this primary August 6th. It is today, July 17th. That's just a little less than three weeks. What do people need to do to be prepared? And what do you think they should know or be able to do going in? Ben, you mentioned um, being able to look up uh, where your polling place is. Certainly very helpful. Um, if you are not registered to vote, it is actually too late to register for the primary. You can still register for the November election, and I highly recommend that everyone double check their registration status. We want you to be able to vote and, and know where and how to vote. Um, but talk a little bit about what people can do to get prepared before the August primary, because I, I have heard from people in a lot of different places in many different elections that they showed up and didn't realize how much there was on their ballot um, and didn't really know 
you know, there's pe people running for judgeships and I don't know the difference between these two or people running for school boards and I didn't even know there was a school board election. So talk about how people can best prepare themselves. Um, I'll hop in here again, just because I know NCJDLB wants to be extra careful about waiting in on even how to figure out who to vote for on candidate election. Um, the judges is a notoriously hard section of the ballot for almost anyone, even if you are someone who is involved and knowledgeable in the political or policy sphere. Um, what I've done in the past and have found helpful for me personally is to talk to uh, friends or family member who are attorneys who practice law in the area and ask them, ask people you trust who've actually had to work with these judges if there are ones they recommend retaining or not retaining. That would be my suggestion on that. Um, I def The way I was able to do that, of course, was by either requesting an absentee ballot, uh, which for a variety of reasons at this late stage, I would not recommend requesting a mail absentee ballot unless you're out of town and that's your only option to vote if you're out of town consistently between now and August 6th. And you can request your absentee ballot at movote.org, M-O-V-O-T-E.org. But otherwise, for most of you, um, go to look up your sample ballot, whether it's St. Louis County or another area. Um, go to your county board of elections website, look up your sample ballot if that's support that they provide, and do your research on each of those sections. You're going to have to decide what primary you want to vote in. Uh, right now, Missouri still has um, open primaries in that you can vote in whichever primary you choose. Even if you've historically voted, for example, in the Republican primary, you could choose to vote in the Democratic primary this time. Um, so you'll have to decide on that. You won't get to vote on both um, and do your homework. That is what I would recommend. So the other thing that I think is really important for people to understand is not just voting yourself is very powerful. It is something that is essential. It's the building block of our entire system. What are other ways if people want to help elections run smoothly or ensure that democracy happens in the way that we would all like and everyone um, who is eligible to vote can actually vote. What are things that people can do both in this upcoming primary and in every election to help that process? I think um, become a poll worker is an election judge is, is a very, very important thing. I know that in a lot of counties in Missouri, they're having trouble recruiting them. Um, unfortunately, the, some of them have dealt with, uh, I wouldn't go for, well, I guess you could go as far as saying threats, but it, people try to make their lives a little bit difficult and um, they are having trouble recruiting poll workers. But I think that um, anyone who can, you know, spend the day doing that. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do and it'll make you feel good about yourself. So that's the number one thing. Also, you know, make sure people in your lives are registered and are, are registered to vote, you know, correctly. You can, you know, check and make sure that if you moved that they have your new address, that kind of thing that, that Ben should mentioned before. Um, if there are people in your lives who are incapacitated in some way, um, maybe some seniors, have them register as permanently disabled and they will automatically have the ballots sent to them. Now, again, it's probably too late for the August 6th primary, but it wouldn't be too late for November. So if someone doesn't want to, you know, wait in line on election day or can't get to uh, the board of elections to vote early um, or absentee, and they feel that they, you know, are incapacitated in some way, they can register as uh, permanently disabled and their ballot will automatically be sent to them and they will not have to get it notarized. So that's something that anyone can do. Now, now I want to point out, you mentioned a couple terms and I want to make sure people are familiar with them. Um, that there are poll workers, that there are election judges. There are also something called poll observers. Um, does anybody want to jump in and like dissect what those terms are and, and what is the difference? Uh, curious, Jen, what your experience is. What I've been told by election authorities, such as Eric Fay, who is one of the directors of elections in St. Louis County, is there is inconsistent language that's used sometimes in law, in Missouri law, uh, but essentially these all function the same thing. And we're talking about official folks who are trained 
and uh, paid by the government. And this could be you, you know, get paid a few hundred dollars to be a, a poll worker for the day. And that's different, of course, from talking about folks who maybe are advocating for or against a candidate or ballot measure who are standing outside the polls, who sometimes you might also call a poll worker, uh, you know, if you're a campaign that is recruiting volunteers to work the polls. So we're talking about official poll workers, observers, election judges, whatever term you want to use. Um, and Missouri has a new law, and this is a really exciting and a good thing because um, you know, for better or worse, our system right now, a lot of the laws are around political parties and to ensure fairness um, at every polling place, the election judges have to be uh, bipartisan. So one Republican and one Democrat, um, basically every task has to be done hand in hand by a Republican and a Democrat to ensure that everything is being done in a way that is fair. So that means if you're in a heavily Democratic area, sometimes they struggle to get enough Republican volunteers. Uh, if you're in a more Republican leaning area, sometimes they struggle to get enough Democratic volunteers. The new law in Missouri is that you can go, and I'm sorry, I say volunteer, but you actually volunteer and then you get paid and trained to do this. Um, so right now, let's say you live in St. Louis County, let's say you're a Democrat, they don't need more Democrats, they really need more Republicans. Um, you can recruit your Republican friends to go work the polls and ensure that um, everything is done fairly. And you as a Democrat can go to another county nearby where maybe they need more Democrats and you can um, get trained and get paid and ensure that elections are administered fairly and transparently and that everyone has a smooth process and has a, that we have a trustworthy process and that after the election, everyone understands it was done fairly and competently. So if you think you're competent and fair, your country needs you. I'm going to drop in the chat for, for Elise to send around. Um, the St. Charles uh, election director, Kurt Barr, sent me a link uh, when I told him that we were doing this. And so there's information on how you can sign up to be an election worker in St. Charles County. There's another opportunity for people who maybe aren't quite ready to, to devote the whole day or, or, or to devote their time to this. And that's the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition has um, the, that they also convene observers where you will actually be assigned a, an, uh, a polling place and you will make sure that it's running smoothly. You will report if there's um, extraneous, if, 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 if it seems egregious, the lines seem egregiously long, or if there are people trying to intimidate other people. And you can really just sit in your car and do that. Um, so that's another way that you can, and that's a vo entirely volunteer uh, thing, but um, that's another way to get involved. And you can go to the uh, Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, just Google that, and that should come up. I'll, I'll try to find the link for that as well. Actually, just dropping that in the chat right now. So these are all really amazing opportunities for people to get involved. Um, we know that there is a lot of different talk going on about elections in general and the upcoming elections specifically. Um, what are some ways that people can engage with their own social circles and really fight the, the idea that either their votes don't matter or that you know elections are a foregone conclusion, or worse, that we've been hearing, especially in the last few years, that elections are stolen or rigged or in some way dishonest. How do we, uh, not, not fighting misinformation on a national scale, but how do we in our own social circles with our family, friends, people we know, how do we push back against that sort of um, idea and rhetoric? Great question. Um, I know Cheryl Adelstein is here and I know she's got an opportunity where folks can really combat this idea that their vote doesn't matter in the August 6th primary. Rabbi, are we going to talk about that after this question? Um, yeah, I mean, Cheryl, if you are willing, I can throw it to you and you can talk a little bit about uh, St. Louis votes. Sure, happy to have the opportunity. Hi, everyone. Um, I know many of the people on this call from many of the different hats I wear. And today I'm wearing a hat, uh, a temporary hat with an organization called St. Louis Votes, 
We've been up and running for a week and we have three more weeks to go. And the prime purpose of our organization is to mobilize the Jewish community in St. Louis to vote. This is a nonpartisan effort. Um, it's run through, it's run actually through Benj's Show Me Integrity program. So it's a 503, 50, nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization and we are not allowed to be partisan. But what we know and what Rabbi Scott said earlier is that many people don't vote in the primaries and primaries are where many elections are decided if there's nobody running on the other ballot. We know that Jewish voter turnout is very is generally very high, but much higher in general than in primary. And so, um, you know, primary turnout can be what 20, 25 percent. Right. It's very low. So. Um, this is an opportunity for the Jewish voice to be heard and mobilized. Um, and I know not everybody on this call is Jewish, but I, I, I beg your indulgence for those of you who are. Um, and so St. Louis Votes is providing um, a set of tools to help get out the word that we would like the Jewish community to make sure they vote in the primary. And we're, we have multiple tools. We're working with congregations who are gonna be putting things in their newsletters. Congregations and other organizations are creating captains um, that will help person phone banks um, using registered voter lists so that we can call people. And one of the differences between our efforts and what's happening at campaign level is campaigns focus on voters who normally vote. This effort is gonna be somewhat focused on voters who are registered but don't vote in primaries. We're really gonna just, we're trying to mobilize the, our community. Um, we are going to be phone banking. We are going to be canvassing, you know, actually door knocking on Jewish doors. But the really cool thing about this particular effort is we're going to be using a piece of technology called Upvotes, where any single one of you who's interested can download this application on your phone. And once you have it, it basically connects to your contact list and it matches with voter lists. And you can text everybody in your contact list to say, hey, are you have you planned to vote? Are you planning to vote absentee? If not, if you all are early, here's where you can go. And it's it's direct relational work that you're doing yourself to ask your own network to, um, to vote. Uh, and it's managed and the data is secure and it's erased and it, your, your people's contacts are not like being put into the universe. Um, it's a very secure system. So what I'm gonna do is put in the link in, in the chat the link for the volunteer form for St. Louis Votes. If you think you would like to be involved in St. Louis Votes, and this does not preclude you from being an election protection volunteer, it doesn't preclude you from um, it doesn't preclude you from working at the polls. It doesn't preclude you from doing anything. It's an, a separate and distinct effort. And so um, I am looking to see if I can post to everybody, and it doesn't appear that I can. I'm going to post to Elise, and she can move it into the chat but this is the link for the st louis votes form if you sign up as a, a potential volunteer you'll be you're not committing yourself to anything you're saying what you're interested in we'll follow up with you but um this is a way uh, for you to be actively engaged over the next few weeks and encouraging our jewish community to have a say in the august primary and i appreciate the opportunity to talk about this on this with, with all my friends on this uh on this webinar Thank you, Cheryl. I'm personally really excited about this as a Jewish person who works in democracy and we often help so many other or organizations and populations around St. Louis and around Missouri make sure that they're turning out to vote in record numbers. And it's amazing. We have an opportunity to do this for our own community. And like you said, focus on the people who don't vote. The turnout for these primaries is about 20%. And so the slogan that we've been talking about privately, and maybe we'll start using it publicly, we'll see, is don't just kvetch, vote. If you want even the right to go and kvetch, then you better be showing up to vote. Otherwise, you gave up your chance to have a say in what's happening and uh, you know whether you're happy or unhappy about it. So we want, it would be great to have 100% of our community actually showing up to vote and voting early. So hope we'll get a chance to talk about early vote. Yeah, I think we'll talk about early voting in just a second. I want to emphasize what everyone's been saying that um, really connecting to the opportunities that are in front of us can be really critical. I know in the chat, a number of people have been sharing things that congregations are doing, whether it is, you know, 
sending out postcards to members like, hey, remember, these are the election days, like, please go out and vote, whether it's, you know, encouraging your clergy people to speak from the pulpit, not to say who to vote for or what to vote for, but to say vote is a huge value, having your voice heard, being a part of a larger community and, you know, even doing civic duty. These are all like really important values that, um, you know, are, are things that we should be able to talk about. Um, and uh, I think having those resources to be able to, uh, I highly recommend checking out those resources that Cheryl just shared of how do you approach this. Uh, I also shared a resource that's, again, from the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. That's what do you need to know on election day? They also have a, a nice fact sheet about how to prepare yourself before an election day, what you need to know and how to look up your facts. Um, but they also have a hotline number. So if you see something at your polling place that looks awry, if you see people that are pressuring people to vote a certain way as they go in or doing other things that seem fishy to you, they have legal experts who can tell you, is that actually a problem or is it not? And if it is a problem, they have a direct way to report it, which is really, really helpful. Um, you explained that far better than I did. <laughs> I tried to do that before, so thank you. <laughs> um, but it, it's important to know. It also has a section on knowing your rights, such as if you need someone to help you vote physically, someone to help you read the, the ballot, those are all things you are allowed to have. If you need assistance in the process of voting, you can ask for it and they are legally obligated to make sure that you are allowed to have someone there helping you. Um, and if you have any questions about whether something is allowed or not, again, call their hotline. They have seen every possible permutation of a situation for an election under the sun. They will be able to give you the advice that you need if you run into problems. Um, so we've been mentioning a little bit about early voting. I got this question literally yesterday. Um, how is early voting not absentee voting? And why am I allowed to not vote on election day? How is that the thing that we're allowed to do? And if so, how do I do it? It's basically two weeks before the election. You can early vote. You can go in, no excuse, early voting uh, to the Board of Election. I is, is it just the Board of Election or are there different? Is it just the one in North County or is it the one? There are like four of them. Uh, yeah, it, if you are going to be out of town on August 6th, then and you, you could go vote right now when no one else is allowed to vote and you can go vote at the Board of Elections. But for early voting starting July 23rd, anyone can go to a satellite site. So the Clayton, right. St. Louis County Library is one of the satellite sites. Um, there's also a location in um, Maryland Heights. I think it's the Thornhill branch of the St. Louis County Library. Um, so for a lot of the Jewish community, those are going to be two of the closer um, options in St. Louis County. Um, I'm not not as ben, not about yes, Cheryl. Right? I can I can add two more that are very close, uh, and I'll also put a link in to how to get to all of them. But the, the, the most central ones are the new library branch on Lindbergh, mm. the Clayton Library, the Clayton, it's called Mid-County, uh, and then the one, the Thornhill branch, um, and then the Northwest Plaza BOA office are the kind of central ones. There are about eight others throughout the region that may or may not be relevant, and I will dig up the link and, and send it, put it in the chat for those looking for um, the... Um, places where you can vote, uh, can do early voting, please check the hours. They're basically like eight to four 30 or nine to four. It's they're not on Sunday. There are some on Saturday. So, um, you know, make sure you, uh, drill down. And one of the nice features on the County website is once early voting is open, it will tell you if there's a line. So you will know, um, how long a line you might need to wait in. So I will, uh, find that link and dump it in the chat. I actually just found a link that has listed the satellite sites that are available in the region. Um, and you, like Cheryl said, you can check online to see what the line is, when they're open. Um, there's also, you know, once early voting starts, there will be someone manning their phone line. So you can call and see, do I have the right documents? How do I vote? What do I need to do? Are you open? All those questions. There is an actual human person you can talk to while they're open. Um, that's um, can help you with that. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention is uh, documentation. So what do you need to bring with you in order to vote in the state of Missouri? And this may be a change from what some people are used to. 
yeah, you now need a photo ID. Um, they won't take, you know, your electric bill, just that you need a photo, a government issued photo ID. So a school ID would not work, um, but a driver's license or state ID. So that that has been a very controversial issue. And, uh, you know, NCJW thinks they form a voter disen disenfranchisement disenfranchisement. Um, and we've been working with um, a coalition that's trying to help people get IDs if they can't. And of course, with the real ID uh, um, requirement coming up to where, you know, it's going to be a, a slog to, to try to help people with that, because people assume everyone has an ID and it's easy to get. But I always think about my grandmother, who was a Holocaust survivor, who did not have a birth certificate. She loved nothing more than voting in, in, in the United States. And she did not have a birth certificate or proof of anything. She she never drove, so she didn't have a driver's license. So if she were alive today, she wouldn't be able to vote. And that's just heartbreaking to me that anyone, that there should be like the you know bottom of the barrel fundamental right of, of people and people are being disenfranchised. I, I believe, and someone correct me on the details of this point, I believe that you can, you can use an expired photo ID if you can also verify the address on it. Is that correct? Or does it have to be a current and valid government ID? If the, just, oh, go ahead, Ben. Well, I just dropped into the chat um, some guidelines that were provided to me. Um, so uh, the last bullet point in that chat speaks to exactly what you just said, Rabbi Shafrin. Uh, according to what I've been provided, because this these laws are relatively new and they're developing rapidly in terms of various court cases, as Jen alluded to. Um, so if the driver or non-driver's license expired after the most recent general election, so November of 2022, that would be apparently, then it is an acceptable form of ID. But if it's really old, an old ID, you know, expired 10 years ago, that would not work. So for a lot of people, driver's license or military ID or passport are going to be some of the common ones. Um, as Jen said, student IDs don't work, even if it is a state university like Mizzou, um, that will not work. So that's obviously a big issue for a lot of people. So take a look at that list. And the list is also on the Secretary of State's book. Um, so there's a few questions that have come in on the chat about uh, judges specifically. Um, one of them is, two, well, two opposing questions. How do we look up things about judges and their records and know more about them? And the other is, is it ethical to look up things about judges' records and or their political activities and contributions or other information that is publicly available, like not invading their privacy at all, just readily publicly available information. How do you find that? And is it ethical to find that information and use it as a, a guide towards your voting? The Bar Association has a lot of information about judges. So I think, you know, that's all public record. So I think, you know, I, it's, it's up to you, but I, I, I don't see any ethical issues with it. Yeah, the Bar Association is definitely a good source uh, personally and as a good government organization at Show Me Integrity. We don't believe that judges should be bringing their personal beliefs into the courtroom in terms of how they adjudicate cases. Uh, so uh, that's not something that I would, you know, personally pay attention to. Um, but like I said, it, you know, it, and if if you're one of the folks who, who joined since the beginning of the call, um, if you want to know the competency of the judges in terms of administering the law and their fairness, talk to attorneys you might know who practice in the region, in the county, and see what they think about the judges. That's what I do. Um, also, in case you miss it, please keep those questions coming in the chat. We're kind of scanning through and... Uh, looking at you know what questions you all might have about the upcoming uh august primary um one thing i'll chime in as you pick out the next question rabbi is on absentee voting um if you are confined due to illness um and you don't think you're going to be able to make it out of the house between now and election day you know inclusive of august 6th 
um, go ahead and request that mailed absentee ballot. Um, I think, yeah, we are still in the window where you can request that because you're not going to have another option. And the nice thing is if that is your reason, because you're unfortunately confined due to illness or you've been exposed maybe to someone with COVID and you don't wanna venture out for some reason, you're, that, that can also apply to you. You don't need to get your absentee ballot notarized. But one of the reasons that we really encourage people to go vote early absentee, if you're gonna be out of town on election day, instead of doing it by mail is because otherwise you then have to go get your ballot notarized. Um, so if that's the case, you might as well just go vote early. Uh, and I want to reemphasize that when we're talking about um, voting in person early as opposed to absentee voting, um, I think Jen mentioned this, but you do not need to give a reason why you are voting during that early voting window. Um, so like if you if you are you know working and your job works all of the hours that polls are open on that Tuesday, you can go in early and don't have to specify you don't need to give an excuse as to why you can't vote in person. That window is open for everybody who is a, a, an eligible voter. Um, and there's another point, a couple people actually pose about this. Um, we mentioned that if you have um, disabilities or it's physically difficult to get to the polling places, you can register yourself for permanent disabled status. And also if you are a caregiver of someone who is disabled, you can also register yourself as a caregiver for someone who is uh, permanently disabled and get similar, uh, you can be on that permanent uh, registry so you can get your absentee ballot at home. Uh, again, that's a little too close to probably do that for the August primary, but certainly you can do it now for all future elections, um, which can be very helpful, I know, um, when people uh, can't make it to the polls. Ah, great. And question. again, they automatically mail that to you and they do not need to be notarized. So that that is a very nice way and nice and helpful way to, to be engaged. Um, so a great question came up. Aren't employers required to allow time for people to vote on Election Day? Jen, do you want to speak to this or do you want me to take it? Um, yeah, I, I'll have to get the exact law, but the idea is if, um, if you are required to work a certain amount of time and you, um, live far enough away that you do need to be given that. So we'll look up the information and get you the exact info. If anyone has that, uh, information, the exact law, please drop it in the chat. Um, I was actually looking for the language before we got on today to to find. Unfortunately, it is not a blanket permission that anyone who works at any job is uh, allowed to take off for voting. There are situations where you can ask to have permission to leave for voting, and your employer can say no. But there is a, there is some provision in the law where if realistically you are far enough i think it has to do with the distance from a polling place um where you work and what your hours of work actually are so like if let's say um you're you are on a 12 hour shift and that shift covers literally the entire window of of voting you you i think would qualify to to um request time to go vote that's right. And if, if I think it might have to be a certain distance from home, I could be wrong, but that's right. You don't just get an extra, you know, hour off work if you work a nine to five job or something like that, because the bowls open much earlier and close much later than that. So you're expected to do that on your personal time. It's your civic duty. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll also Part of the new voting laws is that if you recently moved, let's say you used to live in Creve Core and now you live in University City and you want to vote on the uh, elections that are going to be on your ballot, the new districts that you're in, um, you actually can go update your voter registration address on election day at the Board of Elections. This is a part of the new voting law. Um, so as long as I, I know for sure that if you were previously registered in the same county, so if you've moved within St. Louis City or if you've moved within St. Louis County, for example, um, as long as you're moving within the same county, you can definitely go um, update your address and vote on Election Day at the Board of Elections office. Mm -hmm. 
That's a really good point. Um, there, when you do have life changes, it's really important to make sure that your um, registration is as accurate as possible. Um, if there are inaccuracies, like sometimes votes do get disqualified. So make sure that you are uh, updating it regularly. And even if you haven't moved or had a big life change, just check in on it before the election. It, you, it's very easy to click on that link we put up before and just check your registration status. It'll have your correct name, address, polling place, all of those things. Um, and it's an easy way to make sure that uh, everything is correct and your vote gets to be cast. And in St. Louis County, you can vote at any any voting at any polling place. You do not have to go, let's say, to the school in your neighborhood to vote. And you happen to be on a work errand or something in South County and you live in West County. You can vote at a polling place in South County um, because they do it by your machine and they print it out to, according to your address. So that's another way it's a little bit easier. And is that the case in the city as well? I'm not 100% sure. Okay. The city just implemented that this right. year, I believe. They told me that that is now in effect. Um, but again, keep in mind that if you've moved and you want to vote in the new district you're in, and whether that's a congressional district, a state senate district, um, then you should, um, you, you, you will need to go to the Board of Elections on Election Day at this point and do that on August 6th. Um, should we talk about how to look up your, uh, what districts you're in? Jen, do you have um, a link that you generally recommend to people who are curious what district they live in? I usually have them go to the, it, the, the Missouri Senate page has a, a place where you can input your address and it'll tell you which district you're in. Great. And then I'll does get that, that include link. Is that wonderful. And do you know if that includes other districts as well, like congressional and state? Yes, House? it includes local, everything local to national. Wonderful. I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Yeah, it, and there's also, as Rabbi Shaffron, you were saying earlier about, um, you know, go ahead and and check on your voter registration, you know, if you've had a, a life change, if your address or your name has changed. Um, by the way, if your name has changed, you can also go update that on election day. Um, the Secretary of State does have a page where you can check your registration. So before you go re-register, if you're not sure if you did it, maybe you've been to the DMV since then, and you're not sure if you updated your voter registration to your new address. Um, you can actually go and check on that on the Secretary of State's website, and we'll drop that link in the chat as well. Putting that in. Beat me to the punch, Rabbi. <laughs> um. And I'm actually going to drop in a, a link that um, includes that and some other buttons. So regardless of what you want to do related to your voter registration, um, you can use that link as well. Um, someone also helpfully reminded us that if you are wondering if your employer can give you time off, a lot of them have that in their HR policies. Um, so that can be a helpful place for you personally to check if you have like an employee handbook or just ask your employer in advance. And um, that can be a, a good way to make sure that you are able to vote on election day or vote any other day. There are plenty of people who have jobs where um, even getting into early voting might be difficult on a, on a given weekday. So make sure to check on that. Um, and if there isn't a policy written down, you can talk to your um HR person, and, and they can help you navigate that as well. Um, any other big questions or points that we missed? I think one thing that's just really exciting is the Upvote app that Cheryl shared, because 
Um, if I were someone watching this webinar, frankly, I would be overwhelmed. There's so much information. There's so many different links. There's so many levels of government. Um, and one nice thing about the Upvote app we're going to use to help people in the Jewish community um, get their friends to go vote is it's going to provide all of that information that's relevant to help people. And it's going in, in a, it's not going to give you more more information than you need. It's just going to give you what is relevant at that point before the election. Um, and it's going to, you know, as she talked about, sync with your contacts, allow you to text that information to your contacts. So not only will you be informed, but your friends and family will be informed. Um, and we're going to, you know, God willing, see record Jewish voter turnout in this election. And obviously you can message your friends who are not Jewish as well. Um, and then any of that information will be kept private. It's going to be deleted from the upvote system after the election. So don't worry about that on the privacy front. This is for you to help your network be informed and vote. So um, we'll get that. Uh, we shared that link, but let's share it again. Even if you're just interested in using the upvote app, uh, we want you to sign up on that Google form and um, that's that can be a one-stop shop for you to get this information and um, and get that information to your network. So I just dropped that in the chat again. If you if you click one link and fill out one thing today, I would recommend doing that because that can be your portal to everything that you uh, One question that a couple of people asked in a few different ways. Um, is it okay for, for any of us as individual peoples to directly contact a campaign? a candidate's campaign to learn more about the campaign? Yes, pretty straightforward answer. Yes, it is. All of them have uh, contact people or if you, you know, email their websites or whatever, if you want to learn more about a particular candidate's campaign that is just out there on the internet, or if you want to speak to a human being and their campaign and ask specific questions, it is totally okay to ask questions of any candidate's campaign. Um, most of them are pretty responsive during election season. If you say, I am voting and I want to learn more about your candidate, they will um, they will be in touch and they'll, they're will they usually pretty helpful about being able to answer questions. Um, and especially if you are, as Ben said, overwhelmed by the number of links, picking up the phone and calling someone is, is sometimes a really great way to understand things a little bit better. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I want to like be very cognizant and respect people's time. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Benj and to Jen and to Cheryl for joining us today and for providing a wealth of information and context. Um, I really cannot overemphasize how important voting is in general. Really having our voices heard in the context of community is such a fundamental value within both the Jewish tradition and also in American democracy and any democracy. And giving people the tools to be able to help them do that is uh, really an amazing gift. Um, but also just to be able to hear from all of you and learn from your experience. Uh, I know this is none of your first go around at elections and how to help people participate. Um, but it is really critical that people have this sort of access to information and making voting as easy as possible. That is what our goal is. Um, I also want to say if, if we log off the Zoom and people have a hundred questions that pop up in their mind as soon as we log off, please feel free to contact us at JCRC, folks at NCJW at Show Me Integrity, Cheryl with uh, St. Louis Votes. There, there's plenty of people and resources um, who uh, can be of service. And uh, as Elise said, we'll share out all of the links that were in the chat um, that we provided with everyone who was on the Zoom today or everyone who registered and maybe even couldn't be here. But um, I really appreciate, thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you to all of you for being here and uh, get out and vote, vote as early as you can. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Rabbi. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.